This conference will now be recorded. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Risa Shimoda. I'm the Executive Director of the River Management Society. And um, I'm thrilled that lots of people are here. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're getting going to get your vaccine soon. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the State River Programs Working Group. And our topic today is Managing User Conflicts, Separation, Change Norms, or Uneasy Truths. So, Doug, we could go to the next slide. And so that's me again, the first name, and also Angie Furman. Angie, want to wave? Is the River Management Society's uh, River Training Center coordinator, and also Lilia Mellon is waving now, um, the National Park Service River Trails and Conservation Program person who has been helping us configure and develop and evolve our State River Program Working Group. So we'll have a presentation today after Lily speaks in a minute, and then a general discussion. We'll have time for, for questions and close. And today's presenters, you'll hear from them both in a second, is uh, Doug Whitaker, you want to wave Doug, and Bo Shelby, you want to wave. So we'll hear from those guys in a second. So this is Lilia. Welcome everyone. We're really glad you are interested in this topic. Um, so are, and Bo and Doug always do an excellent job, so we're looking forward to it. Um, this is a program of the River Management Society, a membership-based organization. And it evolved, it started a year plus ago that a group of state river managers wanted to create a network amongst themselves so they could learn and share with each other. And so, but it's bigger than just state river managers. Um, it's we've got everybody involved and we're welcome everyone um and we're just trying to build this network and so we're doing this through these monthly web chats which is this time the same bat channel every month um and you can see on the screen who's welcome um so that's that and then the next screen will say our, our current dilemma with this um is that we're trying to figure out the name for this because it started, like I said, with the state river managers. Oh, and I'll back up and my role here with the Rivers, Trails and Conservation Assistance Program, we help groups um, to achieve the goals that they set out for. So they've asked for our assistance. Um, and this is my, I'm coming up just over a year of helping with RMS on this. Um, so Doug, you can advance to the next slide. And um, so I'm just trying to help this group get going. But as I alluded to a minute ago, we started talking about states, but that's confusing some people. So, and because we're welcoming everyone, we want, we're seeking input from folks and um, we've gotten lots of great ideas. We appreciate the feedback and um, we're thinking about it and trying to rebrand. So, so stay tuned and, and we'll let you know what we come up with. Um, so with that, I believe we're gonna let um, Confluence take over and give us this great presentation. All right, thanks you guys. And I'm delighted to hear that you're working on a new name for your group. It's the, much as we all love our state river managers, it made it sound kind of exclusive. So I, you're, I see you're scratching your heads about that one. Good for you guys. Um, well, welcome from us as well. I, I'm Bo Shelby, I'm waving my hand here. Doug Whitaker, you saw him wave his hand earlier. Um, we're, the, we're the two presenters for today and um, Risa was the one who asked us, would we be willing to work on something about conflicts and capacity? Um, you'll notice that we <laughs> took that topic, which is a giant one, and we cut it in two pieces, whether it was halves or not, I don't know. But we, anyway, we took the capacity part out of it because that's yet another topic that deserves its own treatment. And uh, we'll negotiate about um, doing that sometime in the future. Sounds like Risa's got uh, some ideas about that. Um, Let's see, we've, we've got a lot of people here. So 40 at this current count, we've had about 50 people send Risa information, I think, or 55. So we'll see how small these thumbnails can get on our screens. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge for us to not be able to see everybody. If you, for some reason, are not able to get our attention, you can try waving your hand in front of your camera and see how that goes. 
Um, there are also some, some more sophisticated things like submitting a, a note or something like that. But um, Doug and I have kind of professed ourselves the technological idiots here, and we're, we're just letting Risa and Angie take care of that stuff. Um, we got a variety of people here. So just like Lelia was saying, um, it's not just state folks that are signed up. We looked through the list of who was signed up. There are, you know, people from all jurisdictions. So there's, you know, state and feds and partnership rivers, and then a few other people in, you know, who are outfitters or um, consultants or, or other ca categories like that. Um, we also got your notes, by the way, thank you very much. Each of you sent us, or most of you sent us a note about a particular example of a conflict. We asked you to do that and, and most of you did. You follow instructions way better than university students, thank you. Um, we, and we'll refer back to that. We actually read those things and, and we'll make use of them, you'll see. Um, just for my information, huh, so this is your first test about participation. I'm gonna ask you which time zone, or I'm gonna call out a time zone. And if you're in that time zone, just wave your hand in front of your camera. We'll see if, if everybody's still alive and moving. So uh, Eastern time zone, wave your hand in front of your camera. All right, there's the Eastern zone represented. How about central time zone? All right, we got some representation there. How about uh, mountain time zone? All right, good job. How about uh, Pacific time zone? All right, and Alaska? This is the real test if you're awake. Okay, and then there are some people whose hands maybe didn't wave and I have no clue where they are, but anyway, good. Glad to see that we've got representation from all over. All right, Any anything else before we start, Risa? Go to the order, we can actually get going. Yes, she's giving me a thumbs up. Okay, so Doug, let's go to the next slide. All right, so first of all, good academic start. We wanna talk about a, a, a uh, definition. And really we're doing this just cause it's, it's good to have a definition that is clear enough and specific enough to kind of point at the things that make a difference. And that also then helps you think about possible solutions as well as just describing the problem. So um, we found it useful to describe a user conflict as being two or more groups with different, okay, different, that is the first part, and incompatible, that's where you get the conflict, norms about acceptable behavior or conditions. So we'll come back to the different parts of this. Um, there's been a lot of definitions and a lot of talk in the in the technical literature about conflicts being based on um, differences in values or value conflicts. We'll talk about that word a little bit, but in general, that's that's too big of a category um, to differentiate the things that matter when we're talking about conflict. So talking about norms gets us focused on more specific things and helps helps us understand a little better what are the things that are potentially causing problems. Um, and that it refers to behaviors, so what other people are doing, but also conditions, the things that people or or their their type of uh, activity may bring with it. Go ahead, Doug, that was the right thing to change. All right, and you can think of this as face-to-face. -face. We most often think of conflicts as happening when the two groups meet up somehow. So that's a face-to-face -face conflict. And that seems obvious, Except that it's contrasted with the next category, which is value-based conflict. <laughs> After telling you that values was too big of a category, uh, here's here's an example of a, a something where it's useful to use that word, but it's it shows you some of the problems with it. Um, one of our colleagues at Colorado State University did a study on Mount Evans, where they found investigated conflicts between hunters and non-hunters who it turns out not only occupy different parts of the mountain, so they can't see or hear each other, but also different seasons. So they're not even there at the same time, but there's a pretty intense confrontation going on between those two groups about should the other group be there? So that's that puts you in that category of a values-based conflict. So the point is it doesn't always have to be face-to-face. -face. Most of them are, and we'll mostly talk about that. Go ahead, Doug. 
Here's another thing that's really good to know about a conflict is ask yourself, is it a one-way conflict or is it a two-way conflict? And this, and again, in the literature, it gets called symmetric and asymmetric. If you really want a mouthful and a technical jargon term that makes your head hurt sometimes, um, the phenomenon of a, a, you know, a conflict that's asymmetrical is called asymmetric antipathy. So there you go, asymmetric antipathy. You don't have to write that down. It won't be on a quiz. But um, the point about conflicts is that they often are, are not symmetric. And that's a really important thing to know about your conflict when you're trying to figure it out. So if one group has a problem with the presence or behavior of the other group, but the opposite isn't true, then your conflict is asymmetric. And we'll go through some examples and you can kind of scratch your head about it and ask yourself, okay, is that one symmetric or asymmetric? And then we'll also talk about some reasons why that's important to, to suss out because it means you have to, there are some things that are gonna be surprises um, depending on which category you're in. Okay, next slide. All right, so here are some examples. And <laughs> thank you, Doug, for digging up the, the, uh, the, the two one-way signs going in different directions. Uh, whoever, whoever it belongs to, whoever's river has this two one-way signs, you don't have to raise your hand. Um, but for example, these are, these are some, some of the um, conflict descriptions that you guys sent in. So let's just let's just kind of run through these quickly. So picnickers versus anglers versus floaters. That's on the Housatonic in Connecticut. Uh, personal watercraft, jet skis versus um, water skiers versus wake or and wakeboarders. Kind of all of those people in those kind of motorized, moving faster categories versus property owners. Um, you could have those same things versus people who are in non-powered craft would be another. Jet boats versus floaters on several of the rivers that you all were telling us about. Um, tubers versus anglers. Uh, anglers versus other categories of floaters. It could even be, by the way, there's an interesting one. Anglers sometimes who are on the shore um, sometimes have conflicts with other anglers who are in boats, even though they're both doing the same thing, maybe even fishing for the same species, um, but the one can interfere with the other. Um, we also heard about competition for camps. And in this particular case that somebody mentioned, private versus outfitted trips. Um, that's an interesting one where that, that may be a resource scarcity, resource competition issue as opposed to a conflict. When we can talk about that, it probably has elements of both. Um, competition for ramp space, and again, can kind of show up as outfitted versus non-outfitted trips. and. There are some elements of conflict, but some elements of, of resource scarcity or resource competition. Um, boy, there's a there's a, a you know kind of a modern day one that's transient, not transient recreation users, but kind of non uh, homeless people um, camping along rivers versus recreation users, um, and then some non-river examples: bikers versus horse riders. Um, off-highway vehicles of various kinds versus non-motorized um, uses. And those could be, it could be in the winter, so it could be skiers, but it could also be um, people who are hiking during the summer. Anyway, so one thing you might ask yourself is, are these things symmetric? So for example, for the, for the jet boaters uh, and the floaters, is it the floaters who mind having jet boaters there and the jet boaters who often, I'll, I'm I'll, sorry, I, let me say this as a statement so it doesn't make sound like I'm trying to put words in somebody's mouth. The, the floaters often start out by identifying motorized users and jet boats would be an example as being a conflict. And then as things develop, sometimes you see things like I personally have seen on the Rogue River on occasion where the floaters have enough of a problem with jet boats that they start doing things like opening up their coolers and throwing their spare food at, at a jet boat after they've blocked the river and gotten the jet boat to stop. Um, and then the jet boat turns around and has this amazing water gun attached to it and you know, kind of herds all the float boats over into the shore. So is that a symmetric or an asymmetric conflict? And I guess I would argue, I'd, I'd encourage you to think hard about that. And it may be something that morphs, but 
For example, I think that starts out as an asymmetric conflict. The jet boaters don't really mind having floaters there, except when the floaters inconvenience them or are discourteous or something a little past discourteous, like, like the food fight. Um, and and then, they, then they start objecting, but it isn't so much the presence of the floaters as that they start behaving badly when they're unhappy. Um, so anyway, that would be an example of an asymmetric conflict. And the, one of the interesting things about asymmetric conflicts is it means that one group has a problem and the other group gets to sit back, think about this in a, in a public meeting, gets to sit back and say, well, you know, we don't really mind those guys. They're nice people. Um, you know, we can all get along. Why, why can't we just all get along? And it makes it sound like they're, you know, like they're somehow better people or bigger people and that the other people, you know, that the other folks are not. And it's easy for them to be the bigger people because their ox isn't getting gored. The, the quality of their, what they define as a high quality experience in terms of, you know, norms or standards or something like that has not been impinged on. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to identify whether a conflict is symmetric or asymmetric. It leads to some different conclusions about who's got a problem and exactly what that problem is. All right, what do we got for a next slide, Doug? Well, Are we moving before, on? before we finish that one up, okay. um, just for the good of the order to try to get some more participation, can anybody uh, tell us of a, of a conflict that feels very symmetric to them? We think that's hard to come by, but we're always interested in collecting examples. So if anybody wants to chime in with one where they don't feel like there's that asymmetry, we'd love to hear about it. And, and if you don't have one, that's okay too. I'd say you could put it, in, put it in the chat or you could just unmute yourself, chime in. It, it's also fine to think about it and, and like Risa said, put it in the chat or, or uh, send it back to us at some later time. But right. Right. Our experience is that most conflict, to, to be fair about our conclusion, is that most of them are asymmetric. And so it's important to think about, okay, exactly what, who are the groups that are involved here? Exactly what are their complaints? What are the conditions that um, they consider to be good? And then what are the conditions or behaviors that they consider to in, that interfere with that? And you want to ask yourself those questions for both for both groups. And that's what helps you kind of answer that question of is this symmetric or not. And I think we'll get to this in a little bit, but um, in general, they often start out asymmetric. And I think at their core, they are. But it's also quite, quite likely that if it doesn't get resolved, the tensions increase, the frictions increase, and pretty soon everybody's inventing reasons why the other group doesn't, has that while they do have problems with that other group. So it, sometimes the conflict can be exacerbated and become more symmetric over time because one group is complaining about the other. And when people complain about you, you start to complain back. All right, let's okay. let's move on to our next category. I, I'm I watching our... buttons, it's just not going. Hang on. Oh, okay. Oh, well, now it went too. Okay, so um, as Bo was saying, um, the definition is that you have some incompatible norm, some reason that you that the other use is not working for you. Um, and they come up with basically lots of different reasons for why this is why one type of activity or one condition is not working for them. And we put them into three sort of bins, if you will. Um, first type is ecological reasons. So this is an example from the lower Kenai River up here in Alaska. It's a place with a lot of powerboat use, fishing for king salmon in May and June um, and early July in some years. And people that like drift float floating or like to fish from the bank aren't necessarily in love with 700 power boats um, in the same chunk of water. And so they argue that there's reasons they, that these boats should be, should be gone. And one of the, the classic things they bring up is, oh, these power boats are putting pollutants in the water. Um, those hydrocarbons are, are hurting fish and that sort of thing, or it's causing bank erosion. And the interesting thing about a lot of these ecological reasons is that However true they are, if you do start to solve them, people still might have a conflict with it. So even if we made all those boats four-stroke motors, which they did, so they don't pollute as much, um, and even if we limit the size of those horsepower, or the horsepower of those boats, which they did, um, to minimize wakes and make some no-wake areas and things of that nature, 
people still don't like them and still argue or advocate for some non-motorized days or more non-motorized days, that sort of thing. So just recognize that while a lot of ecological reasons may be thrown out there, that may not be the whole story. And uh, it becomes sort of a red herring and I'm, I'm making sort of a dad joke here about red salmon anyway. So we think a lot of cases, ecological reasons are not the fundamental cause of the conflict. Likewise, the one that always comes up, or not always, but often comes up is, oh, it's, it's unsafe to have, for instance, power boats on a river where there's anglers in their chest waders nearby, the wakes will flood them and they'll fall in the river and they'll drown and this is dangerous and they're moving fast and we're not. Again, everybody agrees with the goal of keeping things safe, but if it turns out that there isn't a safety problem, that we don't have a lot of accidents, that people are fairly careful about not swamping them and this sort of thing, you're left with, oh, maybe that's not the real reason they're angry at these boats. There may be other reasons. So, you know, we're social scientists and we think that the world revolves around our topics, but, but in this case, we think that that's really the truth, that most of these conflicts are about social reasons. Um, and social, the conditions, the type of experience that people want is different from what is being offered when this other use is taking place at the same time. And um, one of the classic examples is motor versus ore trips in the Grand Canyon. They're both going downstream. They're both camping. They're both in there for two weeks or more. Um, but there are some differences between the kinds of trips that occur out there, and there are therefore conflicts between those groups. So the, the motor and ore trips in the motor trips in the Grand Canyon tend to be bigger. Um, the boats are bigger. The, the group sizes are bigger. Um, the trip lengths are shorter, so they they move faster and they do things. Uh, more quickly. They have the ability to, to steal camp, so you could be aiming for a camp and rowing all day to get to it, and then a power, you know, one of these bigger rafts will come flying by and grab it just before you get there. And so these sorts of social issues are probably at the source of that conflict. Um, Bo did a really cool study way back in the 70s um, about motor and ore folks, and that's useful to sort of talk about. You actually got to put people on a trip where they switched halfway through the trip. Um, they did half the trip as an ore trip and half the trip as a motor trip from an outfitter that ran both at that time. And um, Bo, why don't you say a few words about how, you know, what you learned from that research, which is still kind of interesting and not really replicated. Yeah, so, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, some, some of you like me are old enough to know that there was a time in the, uh, in, in the, history of the first river management plan in Grand Canyon. So this is the, the mid 1970s to early 80s, um, where the Park Service was thinking about eliminating motorized use in the canyon. And there were a lot of reasons. And I'm not trying to stir up that, that old argument. The way it is now is the way it's been for a long time. But the, like Doug said, from the point of view of trying to figure out how are these two types of trips different, um, you know, we had descriptive data about trip lengths and numbers of hours that they spent stopped at attraction sites or hiking or things like that. Um, and, you know, we could kind of identify where they spent their time in terms of camps or attractions. Um, but it didn't really give you a very good flavor of, well, how is this different for passengers who typically in Grand Canyon on commercial trips are one timers? They, you know, they've never been there before and this is going to be their only trip. So how does it make a difference to them? And uh, we, we started out by looking kind of back at the historical record and asking, hey, can we find a group of people who have done both of these? And the answer was, it was pretty hard to come by. There were a very small number of people in that category. So we created that group, like Doug said, we signed people up for, they, they signed up for a combination trip that was advertised in the Outfitters brochure. And uh, we sent a rowing trip off from Lee's Ferry to put in and three days later, we sent a motor trip of roughly the same number of passengers off and they caught them half, literally halfway through 110 miles downstream. They, they caught up, they camped at the same spot and they swapped all the passengers and then finished the rest of the trip on a different set of boats. So we not only got to actually sit there and watch how that worked for people as they made that change, we also got to give them a survey at the end of the trip and ask them what are the characteristics you know, what did you like about each kind of trip? And, you know, they told us things that had to do with 
social characteristics. They like the smaller groups and the ability to talk to the guide because they on a on a rowing trip because they were in a small group and that person was just sitting there on the oars compared to a motor trip where it's a, a much larger group, sort of a 15-ish um, group of people and the guide is back in the back of the boat with a motor running in, in his or her ear. And so you can't talk to them unless they shut the motor off and then they kind of stand up on the boat and it, it's sort of like being in a little bit of a mini lecture uh, class. So anyway, people, people reported all of those same things. We also are a lot of those different kinds of things. They talked about social things. They talked about, um, you know, the, the speed with which the boat traveled. They talked about the ability to hear sounds from the canyon, all unprompted uh, by, by any, anybody, right? These were things they put on an open-ended questionnaire. Um, we also then just asked them, hey, if you were going to do another, go on another Grand Canyon trip, which would you choose? If you were going to recommend one to a friend, which would you choose? And again, surprising to me, um, 80 to 90 percent chose an ore trip. So it, it was just a, like I say, I'm not trying to reopen an old issue that's already been settled, but it was a very interesting insight into some of those differences between um, the characteristics that cause differences and cause people to think about conflicts. All right, I think we're ready for the next one, Doug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it, it, there's a pause between when I push buttons and when things happen, so. Oh, well, um, we can't have that. Yeah, no, well, that's what we got. Um, so, you know, as there's lots of reasons people give for a conflict or that you can divine as to why people are in conflict, why one group doesn't like another. It's interesting to think about how they express that conflict. So, conflict, you think about actual, you know, a physical altercation, perhaps, uh, you know, in, in journalism, that refers to a war, um, often. And, you know, in fact, there's a continuum there from thinking bad thoughts about some other group, to expressing that anger through dirty looks, to expressing that anger by writing the agency and saying, hey, you got to deal with this, you should fix this problem, to actually yelling at them on site, um, this this middle picture here of the fisherman with the bad grammar is a YouTube where there's a an angler screaming at a power boat that's coming by and you know changing his experience or whatever. To actually uh, throwing food at each other, as Bo gave that example from the uh, the Rogue River where they were throwing ham sandwiches at each other and spraying each other with water and that sort of thing. So just recognize that there may be um, there may be an escalation process where you know, paying attention to the early signs is better and figuring out whether you have a conflict developing and then dealing with it sooner prevents it from escalating. So just kind of consider that as a possibility. And um, we, sorry, somebody said something? Oh yeah, just before you go away, why don't you tell people who the face is on the left just in case they don't all know. Yeah, this is, a, this is probably, I don't know, late, late 70s, early 80s, but that's Jack Nicholson in The Shining on his way to getting a little bit angry. Uh, I don't know if you know that movie, but anyway, sort of a famous angry, angry man. Anyway, the, the point is you, you want to pay attention to conflicts in their infancy when they're just getting started and possibly deal with them. Um, but I've heard some interesting arguments at least a couple of times of places where if you overreact to a conflict that isn't really as big a deal as you thought it was, you might actually fan the flames of that conflict by, by, you know, saying, "Hey, you're Group A and you're Group B, and you don't agree." Maybe they weren't as as angry about it as you thought, and you just were hearing from a few people on the on the uh, on the fringes, and they're angry at each other, but but maybe not everybody is. So anyway, those are just some things to pay attention to. All right, Bo, well, you're back up again on the sort of the, okay, the thanks. So. Uh, you know, the e easy to, s to sit back and look at examples of conflicts and um, like you guys, it, it's not very hard in any crowd of smart resource managers um, to come up with examples of conflict. And, and it's often one of the toughest things that um, we in the field deal with. It, it, there are some really tough challenges, right? We're used to people um, being excited about our resources, we're used to them, um, 
you know, being involved and being interested, but boy, conflicts are really one of the tough things to, to work with. So what about solutions? You know, kind of what, what does the, the definition that we've talked about and the things that we know by looking at conflict, um, what, you know, what are the solutions? All right, well, if, if these were two, if these were my two squabbling kids growing up, what would I do? I would say, okay, you know, go to your rooms or, you know, you go there and you, you come over here or um, just stop talking or something like that. I'd figure out a way to separate them. So separation of some kind is kind of the classic first thought when you're talking about conflict. And there's really two categories of that. So zoning in space, right? Is there a way to put these people in two different places um, so they don't run into each other is is kind of one example uh, or is one category of the separation zoning in space and um, we've got the example a bunch of examples here from work we did in uh, on the merced in yosemite there some of these are things that had kind of shaken out you could say these had occurred naturally natural of course is always a little bit funny when we're talking about human use but there are some high use speeches and some low use speeches. So you could argue that if people, if there, if the people who were looking for a more solitary beach experience find that it's a conflict to have a lot of people around, um, they can go find a beach like that, zoning in space. Um, if we actually regulate the numbers on those two different beaches, that would be a you know kind of a next step in enforcing some kind of a zoning solution. Um, separating the section where commercial use occurs, which is a bunch of, in this case, a bunch of rental rafts and tends to be pretty high density on, on pretty much any warm sunny day. Um, separating that from the non-commercial use, which tends to be a, a different group of people and they have some different ideas about what defines high quality. So that'd be a, you know, kind of thinking about some different um, segments that have those different kinds of characteristics. All right, so zoning in space, keep that in your head. Go ahead, Doug. Um, zoning in time would be yet another one. So ask yourself, is there something about seasons that would work here? And so here's a, here's a zoning in time solution. This is on the wild section of Hell's Canyon, which is the Snake River on the kind of Oregon, Idaho border. Um, from the dam to Kirkwood, there are non-motorized days in summer. There are three weekdays every other week. And, and you would be interesting, you would be interested to know why it is they chose those particular days. And one of the things that we would suggest to you is if you're thinking about a conflict, not only do you have to do that first step we talked about of trying to figure out who are the groups, how does each group define high quality? What are the characteristics or behaviors that are important for them? But the next thing you would want to do is collect some use data. So you ask yourself exactly where and when do these conflicts occur and what, what is the timing of use by each of those groups? So we're on the topic of Hell's Canyon. Again, I'm going back in history and I'm just doing this for the sake of, a, of, a, of, a, of an interesting example. When I first came to Oregon State, so this was in the um, late 1970s, I got asked by um, the new manager over on Hell's Canyon, um, which had just been designated as a national recreation area, uh, got asked by him to take a look at the, um, their situation about jet boating use, motorized use versus non-motorized use, jet versus float. And one of the things I did was analyze the use data that they had. And it turned out that float trips, because they were three to five days in length, tended to, people traveled there on the weekend, they spent weekdays on the river, and then they traveled back home on the following weekend. Jet boat trips were typically either day trips or, or one night trips. And so those tended to be weekend trips. And you can see where I'm going with this in terms of zoning in time. If you had at the time eliminated all the motorized use on weekdays, Right, you'd taken advantage of that kind of natural separation that had occurred because of the use patterns. You would have only decreased um, motorized use by 
So you could have kept 90% of your motorized use and, and eliminated all the motorized use on weekdays and essentially said, okay, we've got five days a week that are not motorized and two days a week that are motorized. Didn't work out that way. And again, I'm not trying to, to kind of um, re, um, rehash an old issue that kind of got resolved for a bunch of other reasons, which I'd be happy to talk about. But um, that kind of um, difference in use patterns is something that you can often capitalize on when you're trying to think about solving either zoning in space or zoning in time uh, conflict, or excuse me, solutions. This is, this is yet another slightly more intricate example. Um, so this is some work we did on the upper Chattooga River, um, which is a stretch that kind of got opened up in more recent history as a result of some legal action by some stakeholder groups. Um, and the question was, is you know, the, the, the conflict issue was a conflict between anglers and whitewater boaters. Again, just simplifying that, um, so simplifying a bunch of things. Um, but the obvious thing that you learn when you started paying attention to when do each of these groups want to be out there and how do they conduct their activities, whitewater use was primarily occurring at higher water times, fishing at lower water times, which meant that those were also associated with different times of year. There were also different segments that were of interest to those groups. And so um, the bottom line here is you could create some zoning by space and time. You could identify some segments that were not, not for boating, which were just fishing segments, but you could also talk about times of year when water was lower or higher. Um, you could also even follow storms um, and, and do some zoning that way. The interesting thing here is that over time, it has turned out that use in general has been very low and pretty well separated in a conflict that um, everybody thought was going to become a big issue um, has not really become one. So now there's yet another lawsuit to remove all the restrictions. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a lawsuit yet, Bo. Um, so oh, okay, that's, sorry. That's, there's that's there's some know. action being considered. Right, but but this is the this is the place that I think is um, this is one of those topics where you should definitely you know talk around a campfire so you can really really dive into it because there's a lot of interesting personalities and whatnot but the upper chatuga is also interesting it's the deliverance river for those of you who don't know um and it had a, a massive increase in use when that movie came out first the novel then the movie at the same time the river was getting designated as wild and scenic and at the same time a bunch of rafting outfitters started offering trips and it went to you know, from 200 people a year running that river to 20,000 a year. So there's this massive change on this river. The local people were made fun of in the movie and the book. And one of the ways the Forest Service responded to that was, okay, the rafting is happening where it's happening, but we won't let that happen on the upper part of the river. So they banned boating altogether. And it was, the, it was class five up there and lots of people didn't want to go boat up there. But by making it a no boating zone, 20, 30 years on, kayakers came around and said, why can't we go up there? We won't, we're not that many of us. Why shouldn't we be able to do this? And that's where that conflict um, essentially was born because of a decision that went to zero use for somebody. And, um, and that group didn't like the idea and thought that they should be able to go out there since they probably weren't gonna conflict with anybody else. The anglers then got there, you know, got, got sort of angry and a couple of property owners up at the top who didn't want to see kayakers coming by their property or portaging around a falls near their property or any of that sort of thing. So they started fighting back. So that's where the, it's probably asymmetry, but then everybody was starting to battle with each other and they realized that they had a forum for doing this battle. And the Forest Service um, spent a lot of money um, figuring this out and working through a public process for trying to sort things out. And in the end, People were really angry at each other. I was in meetings where groups were really, really being very uh, negative towards each other and towards us as people trying to come up with some, um, you know, compromises and whatnot. And when it actually all got finally settled, and it turns out there's only about 30, 50 anglers that go regularly use these this stretch, and even fewer boaters that use it, maybe a dozen or two. 
there really was no conflict. And we spent a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to solve a conflict that might have been done more quickly and cleanly with some clean separation earlier in the, in the game. Anyway, it's just a, it's an interesting case study and worth talking about sometimes. Okay, I've pushed the button. One more for you, Bo. Yeah, so a, a, a third category other than those, you know, those the, all three of those things that we just talked about are separation, zoning and space, zoning and time, or some combination of, of factors that create uh, space or time separations. Um, and don't don't overlook those steps. It by far the cleanest way to solve a conflict is to separate the combatants um, if you can actually do that effectively. Um, but a, another category, I mean, there are some categories or situations, and and the main salmon in Idaho was pictured here. The snake was in this category. Um, it it may be that taking one or the other of the uses out of the picture is is just not possible for a variety of reasons. Um, in the case of the Maine salmon, for example, um, jet boat use was um, explicitly grandfathered onto the river um, when the wild and scenic designation occurred. Um, there were jet boaters in the room who were very careful about making sure that that, that didn't mean they weren't going to get to go on the river. So then the question is, is there something, is, are there some other things we can do? And Again, the idea of using norms rather than values. Um, values are typically things that are pretty well embedded in the way people think about their world and are a little bit squishy and hard to get at, but norms are their more specific ideas about what, what kind of behavior is appropriate or inappropriate, acceptable or unacceptable, what conditions exactly are acceptable or unacceptable. Um, and so thinking about what are the things that cause problems? So again, this is why we, when we're talking about defining the conflict, we wanna think about specific um, norms that define high quality conditions and exactly what specific things um, that the conflicting group is associated with that cause a problem. And just being respectful of that, right? Realizing that some of them may look more or less reasonable but you just really wanna get people to tell you what their real problems are, not, not the red herring problems. Um, and sometimes it's possible to figure out some, some better behavior um, or to give people information that helps them think through those, those conflicting situations. So for example, I'm just telling you my personal, um, my, one of my personal experiences or evolutions as a a floater, right? Both a kayaker and a rafter. Um, I, you know, I don't, I'd rather jet boats weren't there. Did we lose? Uh, let's see. Doug, can you mute your microphone? I'm getting a bunch of feedback. There you go. Somebody, somebody fix that. Thank you. Um, I, so I, I would rather jet boats weren't there personally. Um, but the last thing I want is for them to stop and go really slow so that it takes a long time for us to pass each other. What I've learned about myself is that if, if they're gonna be there, I would rather they went by quickly. And so what I've learned to do is to, even though I theoretically have the right of way because I'm the non-powered vessel, um, I pull into the nearest eddy, I get myself staying still and then I wave them by and get them to go by as fast as they can. So I'd rather they just went by fast. I don't care about their stinking wake. I'm in a whitewater boat. Um, so it, for me, that's, a, that's kind of a normative approach to making that encounter work much better. Oh, and then when they go by, I wave and smile. Um, and th there's another whole study about people waving and smiling in conflict situations that we could talk about again over a beer sometime. But so examples like that, where you can think about, are there some ways, not, not just telling people, hey, we all have to get along, we gotta sing Kumbaya and be friendly, but more specifically, what can we do to make those encounters work better? Um, and that, the, the jet boat example is one, but there are lots of others. Is that enough of that, Doug? Uh, you got your mic turned off, Doug. There we go. Okay, so I think this is you, Doug, but you're going to have to turn your mic on. There you go. Uh, it's off again.
Now it's on. So it's the delay. I do something okay. and it happens in some second. Okay. Um, okay. So, and you know, both Bo and I both agree that that the, the critical thing is to focus on the specific reasons that people have conflicts and try to cut deals between groups if we can see if we can change somebody's behavior a little bit to make friends and influence people. That's all good. Um, but sometimes they are back. We're, we're kind of heading back up the up the uh, ladder again towards the values idea. Sometimes it's not just a specific reason, it's, it's truly at something to do with values and that people have some defined uh, ideas about what a place can be or how it should be. And a good example of this is uh, in Yellowstone National Park where there's been a boating ban on most of its rivers for, for you know, since at least the early 20s, I think is when this, this started. But, um, for a lot for a lot of years. So this is no boating at all. It's not just against power boats, it's against float float boats as well. And it started perhaps as something to protect bank angling, which is how they let people fish on some parts of the Yellowstone River itself. But the, the point is that um, the boaters again are saying, hey, aren't there a few places in this park um, where we could go boating, we're not going to cause any problem. We're happy to be very low use. We're happy to get permits. We're happy to do it in, in certain seasons when other people are not out there, et cetera, et cetera. But even so, there's a bunch of people that are opposed to any boating on some of these rivers, if not all of these rivers, because they just think that um, some places ought to be left alone and not be influenced by humans, should not be used in this way. Um, it may not even be a face-to-face -face deal with the anglers. There are some um, small creeks and rivers that are up in the high country that really only want to be used by pack rafters, people that walk in and float out. Um, and they don't even have trails along them. People aren't even fishing some of those streams. And yet there's still opposition to letting those boaters do that kind of thing. So recognize that some places are going to be value-based. That is possible situation. And if that's the case, you need to sort of pay attention to why that is and what's going on there. And there may not be, you know, a solution. You have to kind of come up with a, an answer that makes sense for what you think that place is going to be, defining that. Um, so that's just something to pay attention to. And this leads to a couple of um, other ideas that have come from other social science disciplines. So actually, several different uh, social science disciplines have taken a whack at this idea of territory and whether it's something that we're hardwired to uh, seek out and assert control over um, because we spent 200,000 years in small tribes and that's kind of how um, survival occurred. Um, there's geographers that talk about this, there's pathologists and social biologists, and there's lots of people that think it's there is a hardwired component to tribing up and trying to assert control over a territory and that sometimes these are the reasons we have things like conflicts. There are other people that think that these are cultural, culturally defined ideas. And they talk a lot about how boundaries get communicated and, and what makes good boundaries versus bad boundaries and um, how those can help reduce actual physical conflict even if you have uh, different ideas about who deserves a place or whatnot. And it's without, um, Bo and I have different ideas about how interesting this work is, by the way, but we both agree that you don't want to go down the track of saying, oh my God, human beings are tribal. We can't ever solve any problem. We don't, we don't agree with that. That's the main thing we want to do is as interesting as those root causes might be. And it's, I think it's fun to pay attention to those and they may help you I, come up with some ideas about why people have different values and that sort of thing. In most cases though, we're land managing uh, agencies and we're dealing with a common situation where we've already decided these belong to society at large, not to one group or the other. So we're looking for equitable solutions. And that means dialogue and that endless uh, you know, planning process type work that is really at the heart of it. And basically we're trying to get each other to agree, maybe agree to disagree, but also to agree that we're going to coerce each other to hold back and not be so mean to each other when these situations occur so that we all can share this public space that we have to manage together. Um, this comes back to this notion of 
so what do, what are we trying to create when we when we're solving these conflicts? Are we just trying to get a truce so that they're not actually throwing ham sandwiches at each other, or are we trying to have a long term agreement that we, the way we've divided up the, the resource or the time or by space and the way we've dealt with changing their norms and whatnot, is there some sort of long term prospect where these folks can get along? Um, one of the most famous truces in history, if you're a history buff, is the so-called Christmas truce during World War I, where the, the, uh, the Germans and the Allies on two different sides of a ditch, um, shooting at each other trenches for, for months on end, decided on Christmas informally to not shoot at each other for a day or two. And they went and played soccer, gave each other chocolate, this and that. And then they went back two days later and started fighting again. I don't think that's what you want. You don't want it just a truce. You want something longer term than that. So uh, historians would call that a full-on formal ceasefire, and then they that moves into a full-on armistice where you actually cut a deal of who gets what and agree to stop fighting because you cut a deal. And I guess we would argue that the same thing is true with conflict in these natural resource settings. And one of the examples we want to give is helicopters in the Grand Canyon. So I don't know if folks know this, but um, there's a bunch of trips, commercial trips, that take out one day early um, from Diamond Creek by flying their passengers out. And this frees up a bunch of user days for that outfitter to take more trips later. So they kind of cut this deal with the, the Wallapai tribe to allow them to fly out of this place called Whitmore Wash. And um, it's something that if you're on a Grand Canyon trip, especially a non-motorized Grand Canyon trip, and you've just spent 16 days or whatnot um, communing with nature without a hearing a motor um, or without hearing a very loud motor, you know, except when a, a boat passes, uh, a motorized trip passes you. Um, then you get down to Whitmore Wash and it's kind of like a, you know, a Quentin Tarantino movie with helicopters flying in and out. And, whatnot. and so um, the point is, is there a way to cut a deal with that kind of conflict? And one of the answers to that was that um, Wallapai have the right to fly helicopters there, so you weren't going to you weren't going to get rid of them all together. So you weren't going to be able to ban them all together. But is there a way to manage that use in a way that limits its impact and that sort of thing? So the deal they basically cut is that um, those helicopters come, I think, three days a week or something like that. They only fly in the morning, and there are some camps identified just upstream and downstream where. If you're staying at those camps, the Park Service basically lets you know, hey, these are helicopter camps. You're going to hear helicopters if you're there, you know, on a day when helicopters are coming to pick up people. So, you know ahead of time, don't go to those places. And it's sort of an uneasy truce, but it, it has made the problem not be as um, severe, I guess. And it's, it's cut a deal where people have ways of kind of minimizing the damage, if you will. Downstream, there's another place, it's below the Diamond Creek takeout, but that uh, is mile 212, we call it the Quartermaster, where they have the sightseeing helicopters come in. And that's a serious DMZ. There's, uh, you know, I think it's like seven to 10 helicopters an hour that fly in there. So that place is really different. And there's kind of nothing to be done about that. That's a pretty different place altogether. So if you don't want to see that, you pretty much should take out at Diamond Creek. Anyway, these are ways of sort of turning uh, what start out to be a problem with a conflict into truces that you can actually deal with. And over the long term, I think people now pretty much know how helicopters work in Grand Canyon. It's unlikely that they're ever going to disappear. Um, but the impact is minimized, and I don't think it's, it's as big a deal for the people that are taking those downstream trips. Let, let's wrap up, Doug. We're about five minutes out. Yep. So, we just thought we would now open it up to you guys to give some example solutions of places that you know uh, where, you've, where you've dealt with some of these things. You've either done some zoning or you've changed norms or you've dealt with a values-based conflict. And um, we'd love to hear from somebody else besides us uh, about places that you think are, are where it's either worked or where you think it's thorny and you'd be interested in uh, hearing from the from others about ways of solving it and uh, one that I'd like to particularly bring up so maybe you guys will think about this is one that's coming up a lot in some of the work that we're doing late lately especially in some rivers back east is 
you know, during COVID times, we've got more people going outside. Um, and there's lots of multi-generation groups that are going to barbecue on a river or, you know, basically hang out, drink beer, maybe do a little fishing. And they're in bigger groups, louder groups. They're from the city. And they're coming out to places that used to be very low use, focused on either fishermen or floaters who aren't used to these bigger groups. And that there's a potential conflict with how these groups um, how they behave on site and maybe the kind of litter and other things that those groups leave behind. So I'd be interested in hearing about that conflict as well. I know with everybody uh, muted and not being visible, it's a little hard to see, but um, someone be brave and chime in. Please unmute yourself and just and just go for it. We have a few minutes for questions, comments. We got a note from Lindsay who said, Doug, you just took the words out of my mouth. So Lindsay is the one on the Housatonic, of course. Well, we'll take any questions either. Any questions or comments, any category. Yeah. You don't have to come up with one of these things. We I would one. like to hear a little bit of your perspective regarding, um, I guess it kind of goes to the values-based conflict. When we see um, the demographics of user groups changing over time, um, here in Southeastern Utah in particular, we're seeing more and more new users involved in floating uh any kind of thing low occupancy vessels or rigs and we have had commercial motorized jet boat trips on our sections of the river is historic use that goes back to the 50s but as the i should i guess the gross value of the user community changes over time what hadn't been uh, any sort of conflict has morphed from an asymmetrical conflict into a symmetrical conflict as that changes. And what do you think, has anybody ever had any insight there on how to address that, you know, historic use that is no longer accept acceptable by, you know, this new community's standards? That's a, that's a great question, and and uh, you know that you've you've put a uh, a well established and I I'm assuming from what you said a well grandfathered group in there as as sort of an immovable object, and you know that's not uncommon. Um, so the, the again the question is what are the specific things that uh, cause problems. Do you have, you know, if you look at use patterns, do you have any opportunities to capitalize on, you know, zoning and space or zoning and time? Sometimes that works for people. Um, you know, they kind of figure out, hey, I, I could have my own time if I just was willing to restrict it some. And if it turned out that I always go on weekdays anyway, I'm willing to restrict myself to weekdays and give the weekends up to somebody else. I anyway that that's the kind of thing that you would look for for something like that and the fact that you've got a long historical precedent makes it a little more um maybe take some of your options off the table but the process for approaching it would be pretty similar you guys i see a couple of questions about multi-jurisdictional situations several entities managing a river or um Cross management jurisdictions, county to U.S. Forest Service, as examples. Yeah, and that that's exactly what we're working on with Liz in in the Housatonic and the Farmington uh, Partnership Rivers of Acton, Connecticut. It's it's very challenging when one town can make a decision that affects where the you know where the pulses of use go. So if they close a bunch of their places to picnickers or, or whatnot or make it so that you can't swim or that you can't drink alcohol well those people are going to go to some undeveloped place that's being managed at a much lower level of intensity and then they're going to basically impinge on a place that didn't used to have use they've got a new place to go so the, the thing you've got to do is probably 
remember the public doesn't care or know who is managing what. They 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 don't they often don't tell the difference between one agency and the next and they they see opportunities and they exploit them basically. And so we've got to find the best places for these different uses. If you if you assume that all of them deserve a place to go, you've got to go spend some time and effort figuring out where are they going, what's best for their place, where can they where can I minimize the conflicts between the, the groups? And you know, like uh, a fly angler who likes to fish in the morning for trout is different from the people that are trying to fish for the bass in the afternoon and party at the same time. You know, those should be a different, that's a, that's a zoning by time situation that you should try to work on. Um, but if there's a place where you want the picnickers and you want to have a place for them to get rid of their litter afterwards and that you're going to have to build some more facilities, those might not fit with what a trout angler wants for their part of the river. And you need to figure out whether or not you can make some decisions that would keep those groups separate. Um, and it may turn out that it's better to do it in one town versus another. And since you're not the same town, you gotta work together figuring that out. And that's hard, it's harder. Thanks, Doug. Before we lose everyone, if we could maybe go to the um, last couple of slides. Yes. So this is Risa again. We are here for you guys. If, whether you're, um, you've been to a River Management Society meeting like this or not, we welcome you. Thank you for being here. Um, these are the folks who are putting on this series of monthly, whatever our name is, meetups. So please, please let us hear from you. And Angie, go for it if you want to. Yeah, um, we are recording this session and we'll be posting it onto the video video channel on the RMS website. Also, we invite you to join us next month on March 9th, where we're gonna be discussing state versus federal river management and how they are similar or not. Um, so same time and same place. And then going forward, Next slide. We also have our um, the River Management Symposium coming up in April. And we're really excited. Early registration is ending soon, just at the end of this month. So encouraging you all to get registered. We've got six over 60 speakers from topics from visual resource management to wild and scenic rivers to GIS and drone mapping. We've got poster presentations a silent auction, and we've got all sorts of exciting things planned. So again, head over to our website and you can register there and find more information. So thanks again, everyone. Um, thanks, Bo and Doug, for, for an awesome presentation today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody.